Okay, so please give a warm Sebastopol Christian welcome to Craig Olson. Thank you. More affectionately known to me as Jimbo, uh, I actually met Jim um, years and years and years ago. His son Tyler uh, grew up in the youth ministry that I would end up uh, helping serve in. And I'll never forget one of the first interactions that I had with Jim and Lisa. Um, I was Tyler's small group leader, but I was also his basketball coach when he was in junior high. And we had a season uh, where we were doing pretty well. Tyler and a bunch of his buddies were pretty athletically gifted. And so they actually carried our team into the playoffs. And so we made it into the semifinals, one win away from reaching the championship game. That game was going to be on a Friday. And I found out that Tyler was not going to be there because they had a family gathering that they were going to be traveling out of town for. And so I was like, oh man, this is a big deal. Like if we don't have Tyler, we are probably not going to win. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to ask Jim and Lisa. They seem like pretty reasonable people that if I kind of have this puppy dog look like, hey, our, our basketball team really needs you. Like you're not really going to let down a bunch of 12-year-olds trying to play basketball, living out their dream. And so I walked up to him and I said, hey guys, we, you know we have our playoff game this, this, Wednesday, or this Friday, and man, Tyler said that he wasn't going to be around. Is it at all possible that you guys might be able to leave him? He could stay at my house, it, it, maybe even just cancel your trip. And they looked at me and they said, Craig, we appreciate you asking, but family is important to us, and Tyler will miss the game. I'm so sorry to tell you. And while I sunk down and we for sure lost the basketball game, I learned that day that Jim and Lisa Sweeney are people that follow their conviction. They put family first. And I know that over the past several years, as you guys have gotten to know them, that they are, uh, they, they are led by their convictions, uh, convictions uh, as a follower of Jesus, that they put family first. And years later, unbeknownst to everybody involved, I would step into that family as I got the privilege of, uh, of marrying their daughter, marrying into uh, an incredible, incredible family. And so uh, this is no news to you guys how incredible they are. And so I'm appreciative just to be here with you guys today. Uh, so my wife and I, uh, Christina, their daughter, we will be married for 10 years coming up in just a couple of weeks. And so we'll be celebrating 10 years of marriage. Yeah, we're, we're just getting started. We have, we have two kids. Many of you have probably heard incredible stories uh, of our kids. I don't know what gets preached here every week. I know, I know you get the Bible, but as far as those fillers and different stories, I'm sure my kids have been endless uh, sermon illustrations. You'll probably hear some today from me, uh, straight from the horse's mouth. And so they, they run around here. Cammy, our daughter Camden, she's seven. I know many of you have probably seen her and uh, Cade, he's four. They were actually at Bible camp this past Wednesday, and they loved it. So thank you guys for making that happen. My kids enjoyed it. And the reason why they were up here is because I just, my wife and I just spent a week down in Southern California with all of our high school students across all of our Bayside campuses. Hold, hold, on, hold on to your, hold on to your uh, uh, hats right here. 600 high school students we took down to Southern California, and we didn't lose one of them. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> A few of them we kind of wish we'd leave down there, but they all came back, and God did some pretty incredible things. So bear with me. My voice is just now starting to come back. Trying to yell at 600 high school students is a tall task. Um, but uh, man, I'm really excited to be with you guys today. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned growing up was this idea that, that two is better than one. And I didn't really necessarily learn that from the Bible, though I would later. I learned it from some pretty dynamic duos that when you think of one thing, you automatically think of the thing that goes with it. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a little help. I'm going to need a little help here this morning. I'm going to show an image up on the screen, and I want to see if you guys know the duo, that the other, the other uh, part that makes it a dynamic duo. You guys ready? You guys ready to help me out? Okay, how about this first one right here? Mario and Luigi. Luigi yes. That's, those are my old video game days. Oh, those are good. Those are good. Oh, man, way back when I used to waste all kinds of time. Mario and Luigi. How about this one? Peanut butter and? Jelly. Of course, peanut butter and jelly. Uh, uh, just an ageless favorite showing up in everybody's lunch. Mom, could you just make me something a little different this time, please? How about a turkey sandwich? Peanut butter and jelly. How about this next one? Cookies and? 
milk. Oh, making myself hungry. That looks so good. How about this next one? Beauty and the beast, of course. Beauty and the beast. And how about this last one? How about that? Bacon and? Well, I think, oh, no, more bacon. More bacon. That's, of course, we all know that that is the God's honest truth right there. Yeah, eggs are good, but let's be honest, more bacon is better. But here's the truth. These dynamic duos that we've talked about, that I've just shown you, they have changed the landscape of society. And here's how we know this. You knew every answer. They have changed you. It has programmed you to know that when you think of cookies, you think of milk. When you think of peanut butter, you think of jelly. And when you think of bacon, some of you might think of eggs, but some of you are just thinking more bacon, right? And these dynamic duos have changed the landscape of society. And before his arrival, even, and even today, Jesus changed the landscape of society as they knew it back in the Bible times and as we know it today. It would not be overstated in the least to say that Jesus has changed the world. He's changed the world. And it begs this question that's up on the screen. It's, it's this question that says, there we go, that's the name of, the, that's the, name of the, the, there we go. How did Jesus change the world? How did he go about doing that? Well, to provide a little context, check out this quote that's up on the screen. It says this, uh, Robert Coleman, Master Plan of Evangelism, he says this, he says, it, is all, it all started by Jesus calling a few men to follow him. His concern was not with the programs to reach the, to reach the multitudes, but with the men whom the multitudes would follow. And that is how Jesus changed the landscape of society then and how we still feel the repercussions of that change today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10. If you guys have your Bibles, we would invite you to uh, open up to Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. And um, we're going to be talking about Jesus sending out not just the 12, but 72 disciples that were willing to go and take this message to really lay the foundation upon which the, the world would be changed. And we're going to take a look at this. These verses are going to be up on the screen, and we're going to read these out. Uh, I'm going to read through this, so check this out. It's up on the screen. You can also follow along in your Bible. Here we go. Luke chapter 10 says this. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, plentiful but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Wow, talk about exciting. Thank you, Jesus, for doing this. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking, whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this morning. Father, we ask that every single word that comes from my mouth would be exactly what you want to be shared. Jesus, we pray that this passage of Scripture would come alive today. Jesus, we thank you that your word never returns void, that it is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, Jesus, we lean into that this morning. And would you show us, and may we walk away from here, not merely listening to the word, but doing what it says. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So much what we do as students of God's word is we take a look at this particular passage and lots of other passages and we want to know what it says. That we know that there's a lot of truth and there's a lot of insight and it becomes stuff that we store up here. And if all goes right, it actually goes from being stored up here and it travels 18 inches down to our heart right here and it actually becomes something that we apply it actually becomes something that we try to live out. And so much of the scripture is stuff that we long to know. Memorizing scripture is one of the most powerful things that we could do. It's one of the most powerful weapons that we have. 
The Bible says to always be ready to stand to give an answer for the hope that you have. And the reason why we can do that is because we are equipped and we can recite verses knowing that God can, can jog our memories sometimes and we don't necessarily know a passage or we're not totally sure, but God can give that to us. And so much of that is memorization. But this is different. This goes beyond, this passage goes beyond just knowing what the Bible says. It goes beyond just understanding what it says, but it's actually, it's actually imploring us to apply a strategy. It's, imply, it's imploring us to, to, to deploy a strategy that Jesus lays out so clearly. Well, what's the strategy? Well, verse 1, if you look at it, says this. It says, the Lord sent them out two by two. He sent them out two by two. That's the strategy. That's the strategy. Now, why would Jesus send out the workers two by two? Well, there's this old African proverb that goes like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Pretty good, huh? If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. So why the strategy two by two? Why would Jesus want to, want to encourage this particular strategy of sending out these disciples two by two? Wouldn't it just make more sense if you sent them out one by one and they got to go out to 72 different places at once? Why would you just half that and make it 36, sending two people to only 36 different spots? We're going to talk about three different reasons why Jesus would send them out two by two, why it's so important that we adopt this strategy today. If you're into taking notes, I encourage you to fill out some of that blank spot uh, on the front of your, uh, on your, front of your program. So why would Jesus do two by two? Here's number one, co-laboring, co-laboring, there's too much work to work alone. There's too much work to work alone. In verse two, it says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. That's a verse many of you, many of you know, many of you have heard. Many of us have heard that. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It prompts this key question, are you burned out? Are you burned out? Yesterday, as, uh, as Pastor Jim talked about, um, we had a, my, uh, his son Tyler, uh, my brother-in-law, we had the privilege of speaking at this men's event yesterday called Recharge. Man, talk about a relevant issue for people who are feeling burned out. This idea that we can recharge, even the, even the Energizer Bunny needs to recharge his batteries every once in a while. And I bet you guys probably have some kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews or next door neighbors that are just the energizer bunny. And you're like, does it ever stop? Does their energy ever run out? I got a seven-year-old and a four-year-old at home. I don't know if they're making me old or keeping me young. And at the end of the day, no matter how much energy they have, they will for sure burn out. Praise the Lord for a bedtime. Am I right? Because they just send them to bed and they are exhausted. They're gassed. You see, we talked about yesterday, we talked about this idea, and we talked about it at length, that so often when we see a problem, when we see an issue, there's this desire to want to rush in and change something, to rush in and make and, and resolve an issue, reconstruct something. And so often we look around and we think, I, I actually could do this. I could actually go in and, and make this change. The problem with that is, is, if we began to have this me, me, me mentality where only we can fix it, where only we can do it, what is eventually going to happen is we are going to burn ourselves out. This is why Jesus is imploring us to use this strategy of saying two by two. It doesn't mean that only people bring 50% of effort. You got two people bringing 50% effort to equal 100. It means that you have two people bringing 100% effort, giving it their best, so that the results are actually bigger and better than just one person could do. This whole idea is wrapped in to this idea of, of empowering others. And the way that we can empower others is being able to delegate, being able to offer opportunities to use their giftedness. I'll be vulnerable with you guys for, for a moment. Um, when I was growing up, especially as I was getting into college and getting out of college and doing all this, I, I, I really had a hard time of letting go of things. 
I really had a hard time of giving people other responsibilities because I thought deep down that I could do it better than most people. And so I lived by this motto, delegation leads to disappointment. That you give somebody else something to do and you may teach them or try and show them how it's done and you give it to them and you go off and you go do your other thing and then you come back and you're like, what did you do? This is terrible. This isn't how I would have done it. And you're in there cleaning up the mess and fixing everything and all of a sudden you, what this means is, is your responsibility, that your ability, that your uh, task is actually more important than the other person. That's essentially what that's saying when you won't let go, when you won't give others an opportunity to step up, to use their giftedness, to be able to step in. One of the things that we do every single Wednesday night uh, back, back in Folsom at our youth ministry, we got to set up tables and chairs for our students. We want them to sit in circles so that they can, so that they can uh, encourage one another. We got to find people that want to set up tables and chairs. I can't think of a worse thing than setting up chairs and tables. That's I, I can't, I, 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 that, that exhausts me just thinking about it. It exhausts me just thinking about it. So my thought is, who in the world would ever be so interested in wanting to set up tables and chairs? That sounds so boring to me. But you know what's so interesting? There are people in this world that are just fired up about setting up tables and chairs. They're good at it. It actually brings them energy instead of depleting all of their resources. They love doing that. But if I'm standing around thinking, well, nobody else is going to do this, so I better just do it, or even this person that's passionate about it, they're not going to do it the way that I want them to do it, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it myself. You know, if I were to take some time and show them and pitch the vision for, hey, here's how I think this should be set up, what do you think, and invite them into the process, they are able to use their giftedness. And so what can we learn from this that's up on the screen right there? Delegation, it doesn't lead to disappointment. Delegation actually leads to empowerment. It leads to empowerment. If I'm not willing to empower other people, I'm robbing them of their ability to serve God with the giftings that God has given them. In Exodus chapter 17, we see this on clear display. The Israelites are fighting a group of people called the Amalekites. And there's this, there's this, awesome, there's this awesome visual, there's this awesome thing that's going on that Moses goes out there and every time he lifts up his arms, the Israelites start to win. And then his arms get tired, right? It's like when we worship sometimes, right? We get all excited about the song, and we're like, oh, I love this song. And then the, the, the worship, they just keep singing it. They just keep singing it, and you're like, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Or any time that you ask somebody to pray for somebody, and hey, would you extend a hand? And in your mind, you're just thinking, oh, please don't let this be one of those long prayers. I've only got about 30 seconds of my arm being able to stay up in the air. Same thing's going on with Moses. He's standing there, and he, every time he lifts his hands, the Israelites start to win, but his arms get tired. And he's like, oh, man, the lactic acid's building up. Maybe I should have had a couple more cups of coffee. I told you bacon, is, oh, the only thing better than bacon is more bacon. I should have had more protein. Real, I'm really tired. And all of a sudden, these two guys, they come up with this genius idea. They pull up these two stumps, and they sit down, and they hold up his arms. They're holding up Moses' arms. Can you imagine having that conversation with somebody that goes to church and they're stepping into leadership and they're using their giftedness and you're sitting around Tuesday morning with a bunch of friends and you hear, so how was church this weekend? Oh, it was great. I finally started using my gifts at the church. I finally found out what I'm good at. And they're like, oh, is it, is it playing the guitar? Or, no, it's not that. Oh, is it, is it serving communion? No, it's not. Oh, you're passing out bulletins. No, not that. You're serving in kids ministry. It, you're, you're really pouring into the next generation. No, it's not that. I got to hold up the pastor's arms every week. People are like, what? And this is a real thing. In order for them to win, they had to hold up every single gift, every sing single task and job that Jesus wants to set out for us to step into is so relevant. And it is so very important. Every job is equally important. That's why delegation leads to empowerment. Coming up in the fall, you guys are going to have another round of growth track, which is a great opportunity to step into and discover your gifts, your God-given gifts. 
And maybe it's even imploring others to step in and say, hey, you should step into this thing. You can, you can get off the bench and you can get plugged in. You might play the drums. You might pass out bulletins. You might serve in the homeless ministry. You might serve the children of the church. You might have to stand up here and hold up Pastor Jim's arms from time to time. But whatever it is, you have a gift and it's relevant and it can change the kingdom of God. So delegate, delegate, delegate. You see, when you delegate, you can say no to the good things so that you can say yes to the great things. When you allow uh, delegating, that will lead to empowerment. So, number two, why would Jesus implore this strategy? Why would he say, hey, you should go out two by two? Number two, community. Number two, community. There's too much danger to travel alone. There's too much danger to travel alone. Verses three and four, talk about a vote of confidence. Here we go. Jesus is saying, go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Excuse me, what? Lambs among who? Wolves, are you kidding me? It says, do not, take a purse, uh, do not take a purse or bag or sandals. You know, a lot of times people think that, oh, you know, the Bible, man, it just, all it really does is it sugarcoats and it, it, just, it just shows the, the nice, pretty things about Christianity. It only, it's, only, it's only ever this really nice message. I, I, I don't care who you are, that doesn't sound nice. Getting sent out like a lamb among wolves, that's some scary business. That's some scary stuff that we go out there and we face a real enemy that is hidden like in lamb's wool in a, in a fleece among wolves. This is scary, scary business. Here's a key question for you. Key question. If there are wolves, why force them to leave their backpacks behind? Like, wouldn't you think that if you knew that you were going to go out there and face an enemy, that you would need a backpack full of some, some, some strategic weaponry of some kind? Like, you're going to need something to, fight off, these, to fight, off these, fight off these enemies. Why not take a bag? Why not do that? We've got a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, and it just feels like yesterday that they were just tiny infants, just real small newborns. And I've got to tell you, I don't know how people do it. I'm going to give 100% credit to my wife. She makes us on time, and I usually make us late. But here's what I've learned taking a little kid somewhere, especially one where they need a lot of stuff, where there's a 100% dependency. My seven-year-old and four-year-old, if, if they were out doing something for a couple hours by themselves, I got pretty good confidence that they would be able to handle themselves. But if you had a three-month-old or a nine-month-old, that's a 100% dependency. And being able to go somewhere with them is just crazy. Have you seen the diaper bags nowadays? My goodness. It's like packing up for a year-long hike into the into the, into the Swiss Alps. You just got everything. In fact, I think I got a picture of some of the things. So whether you guys got kids in here or grandkids, you see what gets dropped off at your house. You see and you're like, what? That, all, all you had to make sure was they had clothes and, a, and some food, but look at all these things. You got a playpen. You got pacifiers. You've got this special pillow, a car seat, a, a bottle, a rattler, these, these wipes. These, they have these things called snot wipes. Snot wipes. Just wipe the kid's face. It's fine. I don't need no specials. This is just, it's crazy. And being able to go anywhere is just absolutely crazy. Now, why in the world would Jesus instruct them to not bring stuff? Two reasons why. Two reasons why Jesus instructed them to not bring stuff. First of all, stuff is distracting. Oh, it is so distracting, right? You don't have to look any further than your cell phone nowadays. When we went down to, when we went down to uh, Southern California with the high school students, we allowed them to have their phone from the, from the bus ride from Sacramento all the way down to Orange. We went to Orange, California. And we allowed them to have their, their phones. And then when we got there, we had them turn in their cell phones. And you would have thought, nope, I'm not in for this. Send me back on the bus back home. I can't give up my cell phone. Here's why. Because that's that like security blanket. They want to hold on to it. But what they failed to realize is, the minute that they give that up, they're going to begin to realize that cell phone's just a distraction. You know how much clearer, how much more freeing it is? And I can't really blame them. I'm the same way. I've left my cell phone at home before, and I've gotten halfway to work, and I've been like, oh, I don't have my cell phone. Should I show up 30 minutes late to work and turn back around just to go get my cell phone? That'd be so foolish. 
but I do it anyways because it's so distracting. And I've gone, I've gone a day without my cell phone, and I've got to be honest with you, it is incredibly freeing. Here's the second reason why Jesus wanted them to not bring stuff. Number two, he wanted them to seek his kingdom. He wanted them to seek his kingdom. Jesus wanted them to truly depend on each other while fully trusting in God as their provider that he would cover all of their needs. That he'd cover all their needs. God so often, as you guys have seen in your guys' lives, God so often will use people, not stuff, to meet our needs. God will so often use people and not stuff to meet our needs. Here's a truth that's going to show up on the screen right here. The Bible doesn't teach hyper-individuality or codependence. The Bible actually teaches interdependence. Interdependence is the dependence of two or, uh, two or more people or things on each other. They are 100% relying on each other. It's not one person fully relying on the other person and they're just kind of dragging them along and they're just kind of holding them back. And it's not this hyper-individuality where we just reject everything. We're like, I can do it by myself. I can handle this by myself. I don't need anybody. The Bible 100% teaches interdependence. Interdependence. And that's why there's this application piece for the community aspect. Sit in circles, not just rows. This is important. Coming in on a Sunday morning and getting refilled and getting, and getting encouraged to go out like lambs among wolves in our everyday lives where there's a real enemy. But there's also something that's very transformative in this idea that we, Jesus wants us to sit in circles. That Jesus wants us to circle up and encourage one another. Jesus wants us to sit in circles so that we can lift each other up. I bet for a lot of you in here, some of the best sermons that you've ever heard have never come from the person standing behind this podium right here, but the best sermons that you have heard in your life have come while sitting in circles, listening to people that are walking through the same things in your small group and your groups that you meet in throughout the week where you can really be encouraged. And that's why Jesus is making this point. Look, you need to understand that you have to depend on one another. There has to be an idea of interdependence. Would you also agree with this statement that what you put into something, you will directly get out of? Whatever you're willing to put into something, you're going to get results. When I was eight years old, I was introduced to this phenomenal game that really changed, changed my life in a lot of ways, and I still try to play it to this day. It's the game of golf. It's the game of golf. My grandpa loved golf. I played, grand, I played golf with my grandpa for, for, for years and years and years. He actually passed away uh, 10 years ago, almost to the day. And I enjoyed, uh, man, almost 25 years of just spending time with him. And from 8 to 25, I got to play a lot of great golf with my grandpa. And so I'd go out there and I'd play. And when I was younger, I took lessons and I got pretty good. But then as I got older and as I had bills... Like I had to like, I have, I had to like, I had to like pay my way through certain things. Like mom and dad wouldn't just pay for everything. What's that about? And I had to like, I had to pay my own bills. And, and all of a sudden I'm like, well, I gotta, I gotta pay all these bills. I don't have as much money as I used to for golf. And I certainly don't have a lot of time for golf. So I don't really get to play all that often. Maybe once or twice or three, if I'm really lucky, four times a year. Yesterday. After the, after the, uh, after the fun uh, men's event, I got to go out and play with, with Jim and Tyler and, and uh, actually got to go play with Rick and it was a really fun time out there. And I got to be honest with you, in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, I'm a pretty good golfer. I remember when I was 12 years old and I took lessons and I could really smack a golf ball and I could hit it right where I wanted to. I don't practice all that much anymore. I'm not putting a lot of time into golf. I'm not putting a lot of energy and resources into golf. So guess what? You think it's going to go well for me? Absolutely not. I told, I told these guys before we went golfing yesterday, fellas, I'm going to take you places on this golf course you've never seen before. And sure enough, you better believe it. Buried treasure out there where I was taking those guys. You see, what you put into something, you will definitely get out. Let me give you five quick guidelines for a great small group. Five quick guidelines. First of all, you got to show up. You got to show up. You got to be willing to fit that into your schedule. Sometimes that means 
saying no to certain things in your schedule, saying no to good things so that you can say yes to great things like a small group. You, you have to show up. That's, that's half the battle is showing up. Number two, ketchup. Not like the condiment ketchup, but like you got to be able to, hey, how's life been? How's life been going? Tell me about how things have been going. How are you, how are you feeling? I know you've been under the weather recently. How are your kids doing? How's your husband been? How's your wife? It's being able to catch up and being able to just really, really encourage each other. Number three, speaking of the condiment ketchup, here, eat up. Now you can put ketchup on this part. Eat up. Have food. Man, coming together and eating, so much, so much better. Anytime you can get some food involved, what a great way to be able to promote community, to, com to, to promote fellowship, to be able to show up, to catch up, to eat up. And then here's number four, speak up. Speak up. Don't be afraid to chime in every once in a while. Don't be afraid to share your mind. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable from, t from time to time. Because remember, what you put in, you're going to get out, which is very, very key. And then number five, perhaps the most important part, pray up. Pray up. Take everything that you're hearing. Don't just let it sit there with you, but pray about it. Offer it up to the Lord. Say, God, it's, it's in this time that we've been able to show up, catch up, eat up, and speak up. God, may you be glorified in that. And may this be something that we can really, really encourage each other with. And you might be thinking, hey, this is really great. This would actually be better if you told me this in September when our small group fires back up again. And maybe during the summer, because people are gone and vacations happen, you're thinking, hey, I, our group's not meeting. So what do I do? What do I do? Let, let, me, give you, let, me, give you, let me give you a tip. What if you did this? What if you knew somebody that was far from God that has said no to the church thing? Maybe they've been burned by the church, and they've, they, maybe they've just, just, just flat out said no. I don't want any part of this Jesus stuff. I don't want any part of this church stuff. Get your Bible out of my face. I don't want any of that. And what if you use this summer, these next several weeks, to really start up a relationship with no strings attached? Nothing, there, there's, there's no like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to meet up with coffee and I'm going to have my Bible behind my back and I'm going to buy their coffee and then at the end of the conversation I'm going to slam that Bible on the table and say, repent! But you just, you just spend time and you just, you just want to know how they're doing. Hey, how are things going? You know what's going to happen? They're going to almost expect they're going to almost expect you to have that Bible behind your back. And you could show up and be like, I got nothing. See, no Bible, nothing in my back, nothing. I just, just, just want to have a cup of coffee with you. What's going to happen is they're going to begin to see that your life is truly lived differently than anybody else that they may know. Why? Because you've been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you understand that his message is the most powerful message that this world has ever seen. And you are a living example of that tell you what, you give that thing a few weeks, you might even have your kids or grandkids and get, get some people together and toss the kids into the pool and they're having fun and you're just getting to know people. All of a sudden, September, October rolls around. Small groups are getting started back up. And again, you're showing up, you're catching up, you're eating up, you're speaking up. And all of a sudden you're going to say, oh yeah, we got this group, small group. You're totally welcome to be part of it. And they're going to say, you know what? That sounds pretty good. And you're thinking, are, Hold on, hold on, Craig, hold on. Are you, are you telling me that I should do like that old classic like bait and switch, that I'm going to spend three months getting to know this person, and then all of a sudden at the end of three months, I'm going to sort of make this ask, or I'm going to make it so obvious, or I'm going to tell them, hey, I got a small group starting up on Thursday mornings, and I would love for you to come be a part of it if you'd like. I've really enjoyed the interaction that we've had together. Would you like to come be a, are you telling me to do that bait and switch? You better believe it. Because I believe that they're going to see your life and they're going to say, I want more of what she has or I want more of what he has because he or she is so different. I see the peace that they have. I see the joy that's on their face. And you have an opportunity to really build in this idea of relational evangelism. Now, you might be thinking, well, how do I go about building a relationship from scratch? How, how, how do I go do this? I mean, I got my next door neighbor. I've got this one family member. I got this person that I work with. How, how, do, I, how do I do that? Let me, give you, let me give you four quick tips on how you can build a relationship from scratch. First of all, be interested. Be interested in them. Be interested. Look at Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. 
It says this, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but also the interests of others. Don't just be interested in yourself. Don't be so self Take an interest in somebody else. Paul Tillich, a Protestant theologian and philosopher, said it this way. Look at this quote. This is so good. He said, the first duty of love is to listen. The first duty of love is to listen. When you listen to other people, this shows that you're interested. If you're constantly trying to interrupt people and give your two cents and, you know, kind of word vomit all over the place, it's really only about you. It's nothing about them. Spend time listening to them. You know why people... What, we're so attracted to Jesus. You know why people were so incredibly just drawn to him? Some people might say it was the miracles. Other people might say it was his incredible teaching. But I think the real truth is, it's because Jesus knew them. And it wasn't like he pulled out the God card and he's like, well, I'm God, so I already know everything about you. We see in scripture that he actually takes time to listen to people. He takes time to listen to people. He gave the woman at the well the most real platform to be able to share what she's going through. He already knew what she was going through, but yet he spent time listening. Jesus listened to religious leaders, prostitutes, a rich young ruler, a leper, fishermen, tax collectors, mothers and fathers, mourning family members. And you know what the truth is? He knows you. When you pour out your heart to him, he listens. And we got to use that example so that we can be interested and listen to others. Uh, Dale Carnegie wrote a book called How to Win People and Influence, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He said this, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people uh, interested into what you like. So if you spend two months getting to know somebody and listening to them, you're going to make more friends and have a bigger impact than you would in two years if you spent this whole time trying to get people interested in what you like. Make it about them. Be interested. Number two, be approachable. Be approachable. The first impression sets the stage on whether a person will be communicating with you or not. You know what's awesome about Jesus? My kids kids are not necessarily... uh, they have that stranger danger, right? right? It, typically, like, people say hi to them, and they, they kind of shy away. And they're like, oh, I'm not really sure. I don't really know that person. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, Jesus tells his disciples, hey, stop, stop preventing the children from coming to me. Let the children come to me. Jesus was totally approachable, even for little kids. As little kids just, just seemed to, they just, they loved him, and they ran to him. And he said, don't, Don't squash that. Question, do people feel like they can approach you? Do people feel like they can come talk to you? Do they feel like you are approachable, that you give them the impression that you care? Some ways that you can do this, you can smile, you can say hello. Look at people in the eye when you chat with them. Put your phone away sometimes. Ask questions about their day, about their life, about their hobbies. Immediately look for the positive in other people. You have to be approachable. Number three, be gracious. Be gracious. Every example that we see where Jesus interacts with somebody that has a need, he's gracious. He is incredibly gracious. Many of the things that we want in friendships are trust, reliability, and integrity. We want those things. And in order for us to attain those things, it has to start with us showing grace to other people. And then number four, be fun. Have some fun. Be fun. Proverbs 17, says this, a cheerful heart is good medicine. A cheerful heart is very good medicine. Now there's a season for being serious. There's a season for understanding serious situations, but usually connection takes place as somebody feels more and more comfortable. And there's nothing like laughter that can help bridge a gap. Nothing like laughter and a warm smile that can really bridge a gap. You don't have to be the funniest person in the room. You just have to be somebody people feel comfortable with. Be fun. So, why the strategy to go out two by two? Number one, co-laboring. Number two, community. And then number three, commitment. Commitment. Jesus wants them to understand that when you go two by two, you're going to understand a deeper level of commitment because there's too much uncertainty to fight alone. He said this, Jesus Jesus said in verses five, 
uh, verse 5, it says, stay in the house, eating and drinking whatever they give you. I got to be honest with you guys, I'm a pretty picky eater, right? And so I walk into houses and I'm like, oh goodness, what are we eating, right? It's like that scene from Christmas Vacation where they're sitting around the, the Christmas dinner table and everything on that table is absolutely disgusting. And one of my favorite scenes is where they take the, the, the mom, uh, the wife, she, she has that fork full of food and she gets ready to go to eat it and she flicks it off her fork and then puts the fork in her mouth empty. That's how I feel sometimes. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You gotta make sure that you're doing everything you can to be a great witness to the people that you are coming in contact with. Jesus instructs them to stay in a single house to avoid problems. Well, what would be so bad about hopping around to different houses? What would be so bad about that? You know, this cook over here, she is terrible. In fact, I like his food way better. So let's, let's just move our stuff from this house over to this house. It'll be way better. Jesus says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't you understand? Don't you understand that the witness that you carry is so incredibly important? You see, if the disciples appeared to not appreciate the hospitality offered them, the town might not accept Jesus when he followed them there. Did you catch that? If the Jesus did not, if the, if, excuse me, if the disciples did not appreciate the hospitality, it may completely build up a wall for the people in those towns so that when Jesus followed them there, they may not accept Christ. Do you understand the implications and the weight that we carry as his followers, as his disciples? The importance, the important part that we play? That we lay the groundwork as followers of Jesus Christ. We lay the groundwork for whether some people may come to know Jesus in their lifetime or not. And that is all dependent on our conduct, the way that we carry ourselves, our actions, and even the things that we say. What a heavy burden to have to carry, but what an important one at that. That how we treat people, the witness that we carry, that alone can be a determination of whether somebody will say yes to Jesus or say no to Jesus. How is your conduct, your actions, your words dictating whether the people in your world would be open to hearing the message of Jesus. Here's a key question for you. Who needs your forgiveness? Who needs your forgiveness? I'm gonna close with this, with this story. I was at a, uh, at a conference uh, several years ago and um, this guy gets up and, he, um, and he, he poses this question. He says, hey, let, let's, let's, let's talk about the, the most important commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. So he starts off this conference and he says, what do you think it means to love God with all your heart? And I'm sitting there and I've known Jesus for a long time and he says, what does it mean to love Jesus with all your heart? And I was like, uh, I had nothing. I didn't know what to say. What does it mean to love God with all your heart? I mean, show up to church? Have Jesus be the answer to every question that they throw out at church? I don't know. And he said, what if it was this? To truly love Jesus with all your heart means that we cannot allow offenses to build up in our heart. To truly love God with all of our heart means that we have to be willing to extend forgiveness in every situation. Because there is not a single heart in this world that is big enough to hold Jesus and unforgiveness in our hearts. And he said, what if that is exactly what it means to love Jesus? That we forgive when we need to forgive, when we don't hold offenses, when we need to extend forgiveness to people. And it begs this question, are you, are you offendable or are you unoffendable? If people approach you and they rub you the wrong way, are you offended? Do you all of a sudden, are you calloused towards them? Do you hold a grudge against them? Do you write them off and say, that person, I, I can't believe the audacity they would have to walk in here or do this or do that or say that or say this? Or is it, you know what? I got the love of Jesus in my heart and there is nothing that you could do that would cause me to hold a grudge 
against you. The Bible makes it so clear that we are to forgive others just as God has forgiven us. And so it begs that question, are you unoffendable? And ever since I heard that several years ago, I've worked my absolute hardest to be unoffendable. It doesn't mean that I don't take constructive criticism where people have things that they want to share with me and, they, and I know what's good for me a lot of times. I know when somebody comes up to me and says, hey, this was great, this was awesome, here's something you could work on. I receive that. I want to make sure that I'm better. But if somebody comes up to me and just blasts me and says all kinds of hurtful things, you know what I say? I say, hey, I, I do my best and I try and not live in my flesh. But I say, yep, okay. And I'll extend that forgiveness, but I cannot allow offenses to live in my heart while Jesus' love also resides there. That is what it means to love God with all your heart. And in order to exist in community, in order to be effective when Jesus applies this strategy and encourages us to go out two by two, as we go out as we're representatives, as we're ambassadors, as we're co-laborers in Christ, we cannot allow offenses to build up because there are assuredly people in our lives that do not know the message of Jesus Christ and it's our interactions with them it's the way that we live our lives it's our conduct it's our actions that will lay the foundation of whether or not that person will ever come to Jesus Jesus is all powerful 100% Jesus can do anything but I believe that so many interactions, especially in today's society where everybody gets offended about everything and everybody, everybody gripes about any, any particular issue that comes up and all of a sudden there's groups of people that are always just offended all the time as Christians. What if we were the group in this world that decided you can't offend us? You can't offend us. You can't come into our world and say that we're this or we're that because we have the love of Jesus in our heart unlike any other group in this world because we have the greatest message that this world has ever seen. And I will not allow an offense to build up in my heart because my heart is overflowing with the love of Jesus and the way that I live my life and the words that I say to you will always, always embody that. And what if that were true? What if that were true? I got a final thought for you. Actually, I got a final application piece for you. Check this out. I think there's an application piece. Here we go. Give permission to someone to challenge you. Give permission for someone to challenge you in this. Go to the person that knows you best. Might be your spouse. Might be a close friend. Might be your son or daughter. Might be your neighbor. Somebody in your small group. And say, hey, I need you to challenge me anytime that I'm not living my life the way that I should be give permission for someone to challenge you. Here's my final thought. My final thought is this. When faith and unity link together, the miraculous is unleashed. When faith and unity, when they come together, that's when the miraculous can happen. When we truly believe that Jesus is who he says he is and we truly believe that he can do anything, and we decide to unite together as believers and not allow offenses to come in between us, when those two things come together, you better be ready for the miraculous to happen. Because Jesus, when he shows up, he shows off. Let me pray for you guys. Jesus, we thank you for this, this strategy that you lay out for your disciples. It's so relevant for us today. God, as you implore us to understand that we can do so much more together than apart. Father, we thank you for the fact that you have given us community. You have not isolated us. In fact, you never, from the very beginning, wanted us to live life alone. You understood that we need others. And so, God, may we make that abundantly clear with each other as, as fellow Christians. But we, may we also make that incredibly clear and well-known for the people around us, those that don't know you. God, may the conduct of our lives help determine. May that help build a foundation for others who may not know you or may be far from you so that they look at us and they say, there's something different about her. There's something different about him. And may you instill in each and every one of us a clean heart and a steadfast spirit 
so that God, when people, when people try to offend us, when people do come at us and they, they throw criticism at us, God, may we understand who we are in you, that we're forgiven, we're chosen, we're redeemed, we're covered in grace, that we've been accepted by you. We are yours. And God, may you instill in every single one of our hearts so much of your love that there's no room for any kind of offenses. God, would you show us that if there's something inside of us right now, God, that we've been holding on to, an offense, maybe unforgiveness that's been stewing for some time. God, we just want to let go of that. Would you give us the strength to do that so that we can have your peace? So that we can be set free from that? Jesus, we thank you that your thoughts are not our thoughts, that your ways are not our ways. And may we always know that your love for us is unconditional. There's not enough good that we could do to earn it, and there's not enough bad that we could do to disqualify us from it because of your son. Jesus, we love you, we adore you, and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.